Welcome to the Self-Publishing School Podcast. On this show, you'll learn how to write and publish a book that grows your impact, income, and business, all from people who are doing it at the highest level. I'm your host, Chandler Bolt, the owner of selfpublishing.com. Let's dive in with today's episode. Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today, for the first time ever, I'm going to be interviewed on my own podcast, <laughs> uh, is Mr. Matt Emery. You may know him as the host of the Authority Figures podcast. This is our companion podcast here at the Self-Publishing School podcast. And so Matt is going to actually be the interviewer. So I'm kind of inter- introducing the interviewer, and I will be the interviewee. And this is to celebrate a pretty big event that's happening that you may have already heard about, uh, and that's... We are we are launching as we speak as this podcast is coming out. Um, the what we believe to be the future of publishing. So big cliffhanger. We're going to get into it in oh, this yeah. episode. If you absolutely can't wait, then go to selfpublishing.com forward slash the future. That's selfpublishing.com forward slash the future. You'll see some details there. Uh, we'll we'll talk more about what that is later, but uh, it's a pretty big announcement. So with that. Matt, I'm going to pass the reins to you. Yes. Well, it's such an honor to to be able to flip the script with you here and actually interview you. Uh, amazing intro of me, by the way. Thank you so much. I, I want to temper that by saying, I'm just riding your coattails, buddy. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But truly, a lot of those things um, for me, the, the books published, it was like 15 years of trying to write a book. And then I, I meet you. And within a short amount of time, I had a book published. So uh, really good to, uh, to be able to, to be doing this with you. Uh, and I know we'll arrive full circle back at that announcement at the end. But in the meantime, uh, I think we got some really good content for people, uh, some really good questions for you. So at this point in uh, 2023, uh, we're, we've been in business eight years, uh, over 7,000 books published. And keep me honest here, if, uh, if some of my numbers are off, if you have or more specific numbers, sure, sure. Uh, done about $43 million in business. Uh, and, and yet, we, uh, we jump on these meetings together. And, um, and sometimes I hear you reference our company as a startup. And I'm just wondering, at what point, what is what is the defining characteristics of startup that make you still say that? And is there a threshold where we will graduate to whatever's next? Ha ha ha. It's a great question. I wonder what the technical definition of a startup is. I mean, or there's like SMB or small mid-sized business, which I think is technically below 10 or 20 million, or it may even be more than that. Uh, so some of it is the technical term. And then some of it is kind of like Bezos is, oh, it's always, remember, it's always, day one or day zero, I forget which one he says, but it's almost just like that startup mentality. And that's just, I don't know, that's so important to me is that we never feel like we've made it. <laughs> you know, if you're not growing, you're dying. And so it is It is kind of crazy to think about, um, you know, you've been a huge part of us achieving a lot of what we've achieved and just helping so many people and, and getting, you know, people committed to their books. And so it's, it's always like on one hand, it's like, all right, it's cool to reflect back and see those numbers, but then also, and as, as you probably see too, it's like the vision ahead is so much bigger and it feels like where we're going, there's, I mean, I, I just keep catching and we just keep catching a bigger vision. It's like yeah. climbing a mountain and, and you get to the top of the mountain and you're excited and then you get to the top and then you realize that there's a taller peak <laughs> or if you're like on a hiking trip and you're like, oh, this is, if we get to the top of there, we're going to be good. And then you get to the top and you're like, oh, well, actually, no, I got to keep going. And so I feel like that keeps happening along our journey is uh, there's just bigger and better mountains that we can climb. Yeah. And it is. I mean, it's great to see how far we have come. Um, but I do find that pretty exciting. I mean, being being somebody who, for the most part, I just like to I like to sit back, be in my temple, meditate, kind of hang out, keep to myself. Um I never really fully expected to be a part of a company with a startup mentality and then just to find so much knowledge happening, so much learning happening through osmosis, just being mm. involved in an organization that has that mentality. So maybe there is a threshold where suddenly you're no longer a startup, but I love the mentality. But you uh, never start, stop thinking like it. Yeah, that's yeah, really good. So 
Um, have you found though, like looking back at the business going from, you know, just you and, and one other person to now we have 50, 51 employees or something like that. Have you found that there's any thresholds, whether it's revenue or otherwise, where suddenly it just seemed like you were running a fundamentally different business? Uh, it's so different than what it once was. Hmm. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, man, I'm trying to think when that would be. There's this thing in scaling up, which is, you know, um, this is like one of our business Bibles. Let's see if I can pull it up here. Um, scaling up and traction, but they talk about like the complexity of communication when you add people. And this was like a graphic that showed, it really just jumped off the page for me, which I'll see if I can quickly find it, but there's a decent chance I won't be able to um, just flip it through the book. But they talk about how, you know, when you've got one person to one person, it's pretty easy to communicate. And you had one, you had a third person, and then there's three ways of communication. But then actually, as you add four, five, six, et cetera, um, and dang, I don't think I'm gonna be able to find it. Like the communication branches just get exponentially harder. Um, and yeah, I can't find it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and so if you look up scaling up and, the, and that people matrix, I'm sure people can find it. But that's what I found is like, as we, it, it, it was actually people. It was almost never revenue amounts, which sure there's solopreneurs, which uh, when you are fulfilling, there's that initial threshold, which is like, all right, I can't do any more than what I'm currently doing. But pretty quickly, we were able to start training up the coaching staff and start um, say, all right, how do we make sure that there's pieces of this that are scalable and productize the service, which I think was something that we did very intentionally early on that, that uh, was very helpful is so that we can deliver a consistent experience no matter who is actually delivering that experience. And so I think those things allowed me, allowed me to get out of and somewhat avoid the original threshold of like, all right, you kind of, you, you sell the work and then you fulfill the work and then you constantly oscillate back and forth between like, oh, I just got a bunch of sales. So now I got to do nothing but fulfillment. But then when I do nothing but fulfillment, for months at a time, then I now have no sales. And so I'm like, oh crap, we need more sales. And so it's like a lot of people can get stuck in that kind of seesawing. Um, and so I think we did a good job early on navigating that. But then when we hit, gosh, I think it's, there's, there's certain troughs of like two to 3 million is a trough. And then I think it's around 10 million is a trough. And there's where things get just harder. Um, it's, it's kind of common pitfalls. Uh, and so I think it was probably that, but then also uh, employee count where it's like, okay, we got to, this isn't just like everyone's on the same meeting and then we made one announcement and now everyone knows <laughs> and we don't got to talk about it again. It's like, right. all right, we've got to have like a le different level of communication and feedback and, and all that stuff. Well, yeah, and it definitely takes a lot. I know there's been times where I always appreciated you as a leader being um, like leading with vulnerability. Uh, you create this space where I think as hard as it is for people to be vulnerable, um, I really appreciate about that about you is like, this is going to be a safe place and we're going to do our absolute best to not have our pride or our ego involved in this. And we're going to grow because uh, this, is, this is the way that I've always felt. It's like where we are right now is not where we're going to be so long mm. as we really look accurately and we accept where we are and then we can move Ooh. forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yet there's been times where, where you've expressed maybe, maybe humorously, maybe with a little frustration where you're like, I am, I am everybody's least favorite person. <laughs> uh, and I, I honestly have never felt that, um, that you were, you were not amongst some of my favorite people. But um, when I, when, when I feel like there's that uh, tendency or that thought process that could be developing in the team, for me, I just think, man, I could never survive a day in your shoes or a week in your shoes. And so going back to where you were in the very beginning, eight years ago, um, to arriving at the man that you are today with the company that we, that we have today, what, what do you feel like were some of the best decisions that you made that allowed you to, or allowed us to get here? Hmm. Whew. That is a great question that's a hard one to answer you know it's funny it's like even as you were asking that question I thought you were going to go down the path of like okay what uh like mistakes that were made or 
uh, just kind of lessons learned. Cause I, and so I'll, I'll go on a side, side trail and then come back and answer that question. Like, I think what's really important as an entrepreneur or aspiring entrepreneur, leader, performer, who's listening to this writer, author, right? I think it's really important to not compare someone's highlight reel to your reality. And so I think it's, it's so easy to see where we're at as a company or where I'm at as an author or as an entrepreneur or whatever. And it's just like, oh, and then this comparison is the thief of joy, right? And, and, and so when you were saying, oh, think back eight years, my immediate thought was like, oh, that time where I went six figures in debt borrowed from my parents' retirement to buy out my business partner. Oh, that time when, like, those were a lot of the things that I think that, that don't often get talked about. Um, but as far as best decisions go, hmm, the early one would be sell then build, which is something we teach a lot of our authors um, and entrepreneurs that work with us is sell then build. And you will not only validate the product, but you will build a better product. So we did that early on. And I think that helped us get paying customers, get early velocity uh, and um, build better products. Uh, customer focused and customer first. I think we were really good at that probably the first two years of the business. Then there was probably a two or three year kind of wandering in the wilderness where we lost sight of that customer first. And it's hard, like me personally, I got detached from the deliverable, like from both selling and delivering. And when you lose that customer uh, feedback, I think you can just make bad decisions as a leader because you're making decisions in a vacuum. And so I think that that would be one small thing that I think, um, yeah, I think was a big decision of selling, then building and putting customers first. That's a big one. And we have come back to that. And then we've gotten better and better, I believe, at that. One, it, it's very small decision. But I think it's actually a big decision is to, on that note, keep contact with all of our authors. Um, so I run the, the group coaching call on Monday night, and I have for years in a row basically since inception of the business. And it's at a point where, uh, you know, if you just did a time study and said, hey, Chandler, what's your time worth? And could someone else on the team run that call? Absolutely. And is that not worth my time, quote unquote? Definitely not. Um, but it, it, it's this, that was a big thing and is a big thing for me because it's like, all right, I never want to lose track of like that author that's asking me that question. And then I, I now can empathize and understand what our sales team, what our coaching team, what our author success, like I, I have my fingers on the pulse of what's happening with our customers. And it's just the easiest way that I've found. Sure, you can get feedback, but you're going to get filtered feedback. And there's nothing like actually talking to them. I mean, crazy concept, uh, actually talk to your customers. Um, and so I think that was a big decision. Um, being very stringent in our hiring process, Early on, that was just like a non-negotiable of, all right, this is how we're going to recruit and hire. And it's not going to look like the way that most people do it. And that's the point because <laughs> we don't want to get results like most people get. And so we work our butt off when we're hiring and we recruit really hard. We interview a ton. It's a lot of work, but just kind of biting that bullet and saying, all right, short term, this is going to suck. And it's going to feel like a huge waste of time because I'm spending so much time. So it's like, I'm hiring someone because I don't have the time and we don't have the time as a team to get this job done, which is why we need another person. So what's the last thing that you want to do is spend all this time hiring that person. Uh, right. It's always worth it. And, and so those are, um, those are probably some big, and then last one I would say is uh, dig your, actually I'll go two more, dig your well before you're thirsty as uh, Russell Brunson talks about building relationships and always being like a relationships and people first focus place. And whether that's with your employees, with your customers, or with your partners and affiliates. So early on, having relationships with people who are willing to go out on a limb and promote me and promote self-publishing school, it was the way that we got to our first million in the first year. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, that was why we grew so early or so fast so early on. And so I think uh, that was a big one is, 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 uh, you know, dig your well before you're thirsty. Um, and then the last one, um, Hmm. And I forgot what the other last one, um, well, I'm going to say, yeah, if you're, as you're thinking about this, one of the 
brilliant things that I think uh, has been done by, by you and the leadership team is all of the incentives that are run for us to, to make us that much more comfortable in our home office environment. Just okay. realizing like, how, how brilliant is it to have a, an office upgrade incentive? When I first moved into this house, it was a desk. It was this ratty old rug that I got from somebody when I was, I was like buying a spike ball net. They're like, do you want that rug too? I'm like, yeah, I need a rug. It was just like grubby. And I really didn't want to work because I didn't want to go into that room at all. Mm. So I got like the computer upgrade through different incentives, got this desk, got this mic, got all these things, got this, it's just like, it's a comfortable place. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to work hard. Um, I feel like those incentives that, you know, they're not really, uh, I think there's different ways that you can do things where there's like the linear incentives or the linear things. It's all about like what you can do. And then mm. there's other incentives that are more quantum about helping people be the people that they really need to be to show up to yeah. have the better results. And I mean, it's re the reason I, I work on a MacBook is because it just, I just like the way that it feels. I can, I feel like I can be myself with a MacBook. I can't be myself with a Dell. I'm just, I'm sorry. I just can't. I hate it. <laughs> I'm not my best self typing on a Dell. Yeah. Um, I love so, that you mentioned the experiential thing because that's something I've come to think of it. I've been very intentional about is you'll probably notice that a lot of incentives that we do, it, whether it's with a team or with uh, our authors are experiential uh, because I want, um, there's a few reasons for that. I, I, it's just how I live my life to begin with. I'm not a big things guy. I don't, uh, you know, I don't need stuff, but I love experiences. So I'll always spend money on experiences because when you're, when you're gifting an experience, you're gifting a memory. And so then I'll even try to think of like, all right, how can we gift things that are ongoing experiences? Um, so whether that's, uh, you know, like you're saying your office setup or, uh, you know, even just a small touches like at Author Advantage Live, you know, our, our yearly author conference, it's, it's Author Advantage Live experience, virtual experience, but also like sending that box in the mail. And then it's an experiential thing where now they have these little, uh, paddles that they can use that are like the thumbs up and the heart and the light bulb and all that and they have that even beyond the conference so it's just like that yeah. experiential but I'll, I'll kind of backtrack I'll, I'll I, I uh um you thought of it yeah I thought of the the, the last answer that I was going to give which is uh being very intentional about not uh being channel dependent and what I mean by that is a lot of people build they build their business on a single legged stool which is one way to get customers. And if that thing dies, you don't have a business, right? Single points of failure are an absolutely, it's just a, a death sentence as an author, if you're selling all your books in one place, or as an entrepreneur, uh, if you're getting all your sales from the same place, it's, it's, it's not good. And so I feel like early on, uh, we did a good job of diversifying our channels and saying, all right, I kind of saw early on paid media is going to get way more expensive and way more competitive. And we were really reliant on that and affiliates. So it's like, all right, let's build up the content engine. Let's build out like a lot of these other things. Um, obviously with Bella coming on and building all that stuff out. And it was just like, all right, let's keep investing here. And it didn't show fruit for a long time, but then when it did, and that's why, I'm, that's why it's less competitive, right? Is because nobody wants to wait. <laughs> for there to be uh, fruit from that effort. So that's probably one other big decision. I'm glad that you said that. We were actually, Bella and I were talking about that exact thing this morning where like three or four months into doing all the blog posts and answering all the questions and becoming such a, a, a host for all these resources, there's like not a whole, I mean, there's, there's some improvement, but it's not like there yet. There's mm -hmm. so much to do on, on that front to really get it to a point where this is where people go and they end up on your site. Yes. Um, that's a great point. Really great point. So as far as, you know, I, I want to look back a little bit at where, where publishing the publishing world was eight years ago versus where it is today versus where you see it going. Um, do you want to comment on some of the, some of the trends that you've noticed in the past and how they're, you're forecasting them into the future? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think when we first got into the game way back when, it was like the Kindle gold rush. You publish a book on Amazon. There was a lot of buyers, not a ton of competition. It was highly lucrative. And 
also self-publishing, I mean, over the last decade or a couple of decades is kind of transitioned from the backup plan, like the curse word of the publishing industry, the thing that you only do if you can't get a publishing deal to now it's the preferred option for a lot of authors. Um, and even, I mean, this morning I had a pretty prominent author uh, that texted me and said, uh, what did he say? He said, uh, he said, publishers, I'm, I'm scrolling back through all these text messages, um, but he said, uh, <laughs> uh, crazy momentum with the book, sold out of the initial uh, print run, uh, 15,000 copies, uh, effing publishers are idiots. <laughs> and oh it's just gosh, like, this yeah. is not like, so now people can't buy the book, right? It's just like, I, I hear that, I, I mean, often. And so now more and more people are coming to self-publishing. Uh, I think we, we came in and disrupted the self-publishing industry in a major way. And we've since had a bajillion copy artists. I mean, we get ripped off and duplicated all the time and to the point where, you know, probably 50 to 100 plus of our students or authors have created their own publishing schools and are writing books about it and all that stuff. And uh, that can be frustrating. It's a highly competitive industry. So I guess I'd say the book publishing world has gotten way more competitive as a, as a business, but then also at the business of publishing books. So both sides have definitely gotten more com competitive. It takes a lot more to succeed today than it did previously. Um, but the good news is, is that the upside to succeed is much greater uh, because you keep the royalties. You, you don't need a publisher. You really don't. And so the upside can be really, really great. Now it's not an overnight get rich, rich quick thing, but I, I see a lot of, I mean, people are buying books and they're buying more books and books are becoming more accessible and audio is, is really on the rise. And, and so like audio is a really great near, uh, really great medium as well as it's very profitable. And so I think that's where books are going. And then we've seen cycles where people say, oh, books are dead, right? Like, why would you have physical copies of books right and if you're watching on the youtube channel you can see how many books are in yeah, both of us you know it's just like and that just keeps pretty much being debunked time and time again is that people still buy physical books and they still buy books as a whole people have been saying for at least almost the last decade if not longer books are dead they're not dead <laughs> they're selling really well yes there's more competition but if you create something of substance and meaning you can differentiate in the marketplace and there's still room to succeed. Yeah. Not to mention that by creating, let's say you set out to write an ebook because you, let's say you believe that books are dead. Uh, virtually with identical effort, you can create a paperback, you can create a hardcover, you can create an audiobook. You essentially create four products. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm one that we were just talking about the Mac and the experience, like the feel of things. Like I will always have a book. Because I want, I, I like have a very tangible memory with these particular pages. Maybe, and, and I don't think that's silly because that's, it's kind of like universally human. And we have these things that we just kind of bond with. Um, so. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And people will buy multiple. So this is one of the things we tell our authors all the time is publish your book in all formats because you'll sell, people might never read. They, they might not be like you and they might say, Hey, I never read a book, but I would listen to it. So if you don't have an audio book. I'm not buying your book. But then at the same time, uh, you know, just using scaling up as another example, I've got the physical copy. I've probably purchased 50 to hundred copies of this for team members over the years. And I have the audio book on my phone, multiple formats, right? You're going to sell more copies. Uh, and sometimes people will buy multiple formats and uh, you'll make more money in royalties by doing it. Yeah. So I got one more, uh, one more good question uh, that I want us both to answer and then we'll, cool. we'll kind of transition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that we're in a competitive industry and it's ever growing. Even our own customers are now competing with us in some cases, more power to them. Um, what do you feel like at this point in time, seeing the reasons that people are publishing books, uh, why does it make sense for them to come and work with us versus all of the other options that they have? And there are mm. plenty of options. Yeah, there's tons of options. Uh, I would say, you know, there's three primary competitors that we have. Uh, and the first two, so competitor number one is not doing the book. <laughs> um, competitor number two is doing the book yourself. 
and then competitor number three is our actual competitors, <laughs> right? And so I'll say not doing the book, I think it'll be the biggest mistake you ever make in your life. It, it, I just got done over the holidays talking with my family about how we wish we had books written by my grandpa that passed away that I, I barely got to know, right? And and so even if it's just for your kids, like not doing the book in my belief is, 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 is it's, it shouldn't be an option. And you should definitely work with us instead because we're going to help you actually get the book done. Then there's, all right, doing the book yourself, which again, it, now to make a long answer longer, like there's this, you can either spend time to save money or you can spend money to save time, right? So if you are low on money and high on time, then maybe it makes sense to, to not work with us and do it yourself. That being said, you better be high on discipline <laughs> and you better be high on work ethic because there's a reason why According to the New York Times, 81% of people want to write a book and less than 1% of people actually do it, right? It's, it's because people need a process and they need accountability. And then it comes down to, okay, if you're actually saying, hey, should I work with self-publishing school or self-publishing.com or, or, or someone else? Um, then I think that's, uh, that's where I would say it's like highest quality books at the best value. We will help you sell more. Like our goal is to save you hundreds of hours in the process, which if you value your time, let's say 20 bucks an hour, thousands of dollars worth of your time. We're going to help you save. We're going to help you save hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on the process, which over the last year, I'll talk about this in a little bit. We've built a lot of really built a traditional publishing arm where we can, but in a self-published mechanism, where we can create high quality book covers, format your book, all that stuff. So we'll save you a bunch of money and then we'll help you actually get the book done. The book will sell more copies and grow your business if you have one. So that's how I look at it. How do you look at it? I mean, you talk to people yeah. about this every, all day, every day. I know. And I think that that's, uh, it gives me a, a good perspective on, on like what a lot of people are dreaming about um, and just how little people truly grasp potential. Um, Going back, this is going to circle back a little bit to the idea that we started with on this like startup mentality. I think in many ways, the, the fact that we have you and your mind uh, at the helm um, and creating a, a, a company with a startup mentality, um, people come into this environment and their intention is, I want to write a book. It's like they're looking, let's, if these were blueprints, they're looking at one little small corner of the blueprint that is have a published book. And then when they, when they immerse themselves into our community, you mentioned like being deliberate about really like allowing yourself to be seen and spend time with these people, um, you know, employees included. I, I, my life is an education working for this company where at one point I just glimpsed the little corner of these blueprints to write the book. And before I knew it, I realized like, no, there's this entire, uh, there's so much potential with a book that you haven't even considered. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to go and do a bunch of these things that you're not going to find enjoyable or authentic. It's just going to be, here's how you can continue to do things that make a lot of sense for you to just arrive at your dream so much easier. And you're not like this, um, you know, entrepreneur from another industry that decided to run a publishing company. It was like, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago, you wrote a book. And then that book became successful. And you realized, man, I kind of have developed two skill sets here that are quite attractive to people. And the blueprint starts to expand a little bit more. Let's not just teach people how to write the book in this little corner. Let's also teach people how they can market their own books and have a successful book. But then so many people were wanting to know that, that like, how do we deliver this information to people better? It's like, well, let's build a course. In the process of building a course, it's like the blueprint expands. So many people that want to write books also want to, they want to speak, they want to build courses, they want yeah. to do coaching. So, yep. so often, that's so why I think like you at the helm is, um, uh, you bring these blueprints, like so often people come in and they say, yeah, I want to write a book. And then over here, I also want to do some speaking. So I'm probably going to go hire somebody to help me with my speaking stuff. I'm going to build a course too. So I'll go hire somebody else for that. Um, you know, I, I probably want to do some coaching and some workshops. And I'm like, this is so funny because the, the vision that you're describing is literally the blueprint of our, of our company here. Yeah. And 
<laughs> even though it's called self-publishing school, selfpublishing.com, it's like uh, all of these things, you can come and you can build the entire dream here. And we know how to build it because this is what we're actively building. Teach from experience. Yeah. So that's, that's my answer. Love it. I love Good it. Stuff. Um, yeah. If you had any, anything else that you wanted to add, I think that you were, uh, those are my questions. Cool. So guys, I, I hope that this has been a helpful, just looking back, I wanted to record this episode, like I said, at the top of this episode, as just a reflection on, all right, in the last, you know, going on eight years, I think it, it's like we're, maybe a, a month from our eighth birthday. We've published about 7,000 books. We've been on the Inc. 5,000 list. Five times is one of the 5,000 uh, fastest growing private companies in America. That's helped me to land on uh, the Forbes 30 under 30 list. Uh, and we've you know done 43 million or maybe even more than that at this point in, in business in that eight years and sold a lot of books, <laughs> a lot of, I mean, that's 7,000 books that we, that, that were published that we can track. We know that there's a lot more than that. And so uh, in recording this episode, I want to reflect on that, but I also wanted to let this serve as an announcement of the future and the future of what's, what's coming. And now you may have seen at the tail end of last year, uh, we talked about how we're shutting down self-publishing school and self-publishing school is closing and self-publishing school is officially closed leading up to today, which I believe is the biggest announcement in self-publishing school's history. And maybe we'll look back on this decades from now and see this as one of the biggest announcements or moments in the history of the publishing industry, um, because we are announcing what we believe to be the future of publishing. All right. And the future of publishing. So we've been kind of in the lab over the last year, building out a lot of kind of what I alluded to earlier, um, services. We, I call this like final mile publishing services, right? So when, you know, there's traditional publishers, which publish your book for you, there's hybrid or vanity publishers, uh, and then there's self-publishing. Well, what we've created, we believe is a traditional publishing arm. So we can publish really high quality books, but where you keep all of the rights and royalties. So it's a traditionally published quality book that's self-published <laughs> where you don't have to self-publish yourself. <laughs> And you keep all the rights and royalties. And it's in a ridiculously affordable price. And this is launching on our new home and our new business, which is selfpublishing.com. Okay. So the future of publishing is selfpublishing.com. Now, what our, our goal, which you may have heard us talk about, is our, our big, hairy, audacious goal, as Jim Collins calls it, is, is to publish 100,000 books by 2035. And that is still our goal. We're about 7,000 away there. So we've made a lot of progress. We got a long way to go. Some might say we're a startup. <laughs> uh, we're just getting started. And, and, but we believe that we will be able to help more authors succeed, not only just by teaching them, which and we're an education company kind of at our heart and soul. And, but as we evolved, we caught a bigger vision, right? And we realized that, all right, we can help people. Some of this stuff, it's just like, we're coaching you through it and we're helping you get the book done, but then you got to hire a cover designer. You got to hire an editor. You got to hire a formatter. You got to hire so maybe even someone to upload your book for you. You got to buy an ISBN. All right, I'm confused by that. Should I go with Ingram Spark? Should I go with Amazon? Where should I publish? And so what if we just did all those things for you? And so that's what we're launching uh, is a lot of those services that we've really, uh, I'd say perfecting, but I don't believe that anything's ever perfect. <laughs> It's always a work in progress and we're always making it better. Uh, but we've really been uh, fashioning that and making it better over the last year. And uh, we're officially launching it to the public as selfpublishing.com. We've got brand new programs, brand new products. We've got better pricing. We've, there, there's just so much that's going into it. So uh, if this is something that you're interested in learning more about, all you have to do is go to selfpublishing.com forward slash the future. All right. When you go to that page, so this is officially launch day at the time of this podcast uh, being released. And there's two things that you can do on that page. So we're running, uh, number one, we're running a giveaway in the month of January. All right. So you can win a writer's retreat to Bolt Farm Treehouse. Uh, this is my brother and sister-in-law. Um, they created Bolt Farm Treehouses. They're on Netflix's uh, World's Most Amazing Vacation Rental Show. But basically it's these luxury 
tree houses, domes, and mirror cabins, which are really snazzy. Uh, and one person's going to win a writer's retreat, weekend trip to Bolt Farm Tree Houses. All you have to do to enter to win is go to that page, selfpublishing.com forward slash the future. Share the announcement. There's a couple of things that you can do to get points, enter to win. Excuse me, every single person that enters to win, you're going to get a free digital copy of my book, audiobook copy, and a bunch of other bundle of resources, all of the resources surrounding this book. And so if you enter to win, everyone's a winner and one person's going to be a big winner. So that's the first thing. Second piece is we are funding, this is our goal to fund 75 libraries in the month of January. All right. And so the way that we're doing that is for every two people that sign up for self-publishing school, <laughs> self-publishing school, self-publishing.com, uh, old habits die hard. Uh, so every two people that sign up uh, as part of self-publishing.com in the month of January, all right, um, you will be funding a library. All right, so you could join with an accountability partner, or if you join yourself, uh, you're funding half of a library. But the way that we're doing this is we're partnering with an awesome organization. We've partnered with them before. We funded libraries before. Um, but essentially, there's um, in a lot of schools in a lot of areas of Africa, they have an hour of reading time per day. And a lot of kids exist in these schools where they've got an hour of reading time a day, mandatory, it's required, and they have no books to read, which is just a tragedy. And we believe at selfpublishing.com that books change lives, right? Books change the lives of readers and of authors. So we want to support both of those groups, always. We will always support those two groups, right? And so partnering with this organization, for every two people that sign up in the month of January, we're donating a thousand books, which will fund uh, one library, right? So essentially they've got these books collected. We're sending those books over there uh, and so that they can actually get in the hands of kids who can read them. So all you have to do if you want to fund a library is book a call with the team uh, and let's talk about getting our help with your book, okay? So selfpublishing.com forward slash the future, go to that same page. You'll see two things right on that page. You'll see a little video that explains uh, what's happening. And then you'll see where you can enter to win the writer's retreat by sharing about the launch, or you can book a call with the team and get our help with your next book or with your first book. If, you, if you've been a customer for a while and it was a long time and you want to start working with us again, um, we'll book a call. We'd love to chat with you. Um, but that's also on that page. And then obviously, if you want to share this podcast episode or share the announcement on that page, you can see that there. Uh, then that's the best way to get this in the hands of as many people as possible so that we can fund those 75 libraries uh, in the month of January. All right, so head on over to selfpublishing.com forward slash the future. Uh, you'll find all the details there. Uh, we'd love to work with you and we'd love for you to be a part of the future of publishing. All right. Uh, so Matt, anything that you, anything that you're excited about or anything you'd like to add kind of as we wrap up here? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Thanks for kicking it back to me. I was just thinking about um, the implications of some of those goals, like a hundred thousand books published in the next few years, next 13 years, 12 years. Um, the, the idea that somebody can take words and they can put them down in a place uh, like in their computer or even you know, writing them down, something that's very accessible to anybody. And then publish those thoughts, get them out into the world and know exactly how to like really differentiate themselves from other books that are out there. Uh, to me, I, and maybe this is very grandiose, grandiose like I tend to maybe uh, get a little too philosophical with things sometimes, but. I feel like what we're creating is a, a world that is just more inherently artistic, more inherently themselves. Like if, if you didn't have to go punch a clock, if you could wake up on any given day of the week in your life and it's like, all I'm doing today is being myself and being creative and writing things, I feel like we're, we're moving toward exactly the type of world that I want to live in. So mm, excited mm. To, to be a part of that for people. Well, ho hopefully that's what we're creating. And that, that would be my kind of my parting piece of encouragement uh, for everyone here is, is, you know, there's a lot of stuff 
there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. And spoiler alert, there always will be. <laughs> I mean, there, there's always going to be stuff going on. And But what we can control is what we can control. And I've always tried with what we do at self-publishing school is to just say, hey, like, let's focus on the area of the world that we can change and let's go change that area of the world. And I think that applies for us as a company and in this next evolution of our company with selfpublishing.com. But I also think it applies to everyone listening to this or watching on the YouTube channel to you and your books, right? It's like, that is a mechanism that you, where you can create that book. That book goes on to impact thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even millions of people. Long after you're off this earth, that book is making a difference. So if you want to make the world a better place, don't complain about it. Don't go on social media. <laughs> Be about it, right? Write the book. Uh, and, and that is the area where you can really make a big difference. And just like Matt was saying earlier, it's kind of like that blueprint where you only see one square. And so you might only see that book. But if, if you're like a lot of people that we've worked with, you know, we say a book is kind of like this key that opens the door to Narnia, right? It's there's this world of opportunity that only exists for published authors. And I think you'll find that, but it takes, it starts with taking that first leap. So maybe it's in this year, 2023, I would encourage you don't wait. Uh, you know, it's, it, there's never going to be a perfect time to do it. You're going to have to get started before you're ready. So I hope that this has been an inspiring episode. Uh, we'd love to help you with your book at selfpublishing.com. Um, just go to selfpublishing.com forward slash the future book a call with the team or uh, enter to win the writer's retreat. And we'll see you on the other side.